Here, as at Hong Kong and Calcutta, were mixed crowds of all races, Americans and English, Chinamen and Dutchmen, mostly merchants ready to buy or sell anything. The Frenchman felt himself as much alone among them as if he had dropped down in the midst of Hottentots. He had at least one resource to call on, the French and English consuls at Yokohama for assistance, but he shrank from telling the story of his adventures, intimately connected as it was with that of his master, and before doing so he determined to exhaust all other means of aid. As chance did not favor him in the European quarter, he penetrated that inhabited by the native Japanese, determined, if necessary, to push on to Yeddo. The Japanese quarter of Yokohama is called Benton, after the goddess of the sea who is worshipped on the islands round about. There Passepartout beheld beautiful fir and cedar groves, sacred gates of a singular architecture, bridges half hid in the midst of bamboos and reeds, temples shaded by immense cedar trees, holy retreats where were sheltered Buddhist priests and sectaries of Confucius, and interminable streets, where a perfect harvest of rose-tinted and red-cheeked children who looked as if they had been cut out of Japanese screens and who were playing in the midst of short-legged poodles and yellowish cats might have been gathered. The streets were crowded with people. Priests were passing in processions, beating their dreary tambourines. Police and custom-house officers with pointed hats encrusted with lac and carrying two sabers hung to their waists. Soldiers clad in blue cotton with white stripes and bearing guns, the Mikado's guards enveloped in silken doubles, hauberks and coats of mail, and numbers of military folk of all ranks, for the military profession is as much respected in Japan as it is despised in China, went hither and thither in groups and pairs. Passepartout saw, too, begging friars, long-robed pilgrims, and simple civilians with their warped and jet-black hair, big heads, long butts, slender legs, short stature, and complexions varying from copper color to a dead white, but never yellow like the Chinese, from whom the Japanese widely differ. He did not fail to observe the curious equipages, carriages, and palanquins, barrows supplied with sails and litters made of bamboo, nor the women whom he thought not especially handsome, who took little steps with their little feet, whereon they wore canvas shoes, straw sandals, and clogs of worked wood, and who displayed tight-looking eyes, flat chests, teeth fashionably blackened, and gowns crossed with silken scarves, tied in an enormous knot behind an ornament which the modern Parisian ladies seem to have borrowed from the dames of Japan. Passepartout wandered for several hours in the midst of this motley crowd, looking in at the windows of the rich and curious shops, the jewelry establishments glittering with quaint Japanese ornaments, the restaurants decked with streamers and banners, the tea-houses where the odorous beverage was being drunk with sake, a liquor concocted from the fermentation of rice, and the comfortable smoking-houses, where they were puffing not opium, which is almost unknown in Japan, but a very fine stringy tobacco. He went on till he found himself in the fields, in the midst of vast rice plantations. There he saw dazzling camellias expanding themselves, with flowers which were giving forth their last colors and perfumes, not on bushes, but on trees, and within bamboo enclosures, cherry, plum, and apple trees, which the Japanese cultivate rather for their blossoms than their fruit, and which queerly fashioned, grinning scarecrows protected from the sparrows, pigeons, ravens, and other voracious birds. On the branches of the cedars were perched large eagles. Amid the foliage of the weeping willows were herons solemnly standing on one leg, and on every hand were crows, ducks, hawks, wild birds, and a multitude of cranes, which the Japanese consider sacred, and which to their minds symbolize long life and prosperity. As he was strolling along, Passepartout espied some violets among the shrubs. Good, said he, I'll have some supper. But on smelling them he found that they were odorless. No chance there, thought he. The worthy fellow had certainly taken good care to eat as hearty a breakfast as possible before leaving the Carnatic, 
but as he had been walking about all day the demands of hunger were becoming importunate. He observed that the butcher's stalls contained neither mutton, goat, nor pork, and knowing also that it is a sacrilege to kill cattle which are preserved solely for farming, he made up his mind that meat was far from plentiful in Yokohama, nor was he mistaken, and in default of butcher's meat he could have wished for a quarter of wild boar or deer, a partridge, or some quails, some game or fish which, with rice, the Japanese eat almost exclusively. But he found it necessary to keep up a stout heart and to postpone the meal he craved till the following morning. Night came, and Passepartout re-entered the native quarter, where he wandered through the streets lit by varicolored lanterns. Looking on at the dancers who were executing skillful steps and boundings, and the astrologers who stood in the open air with their telescopes, then he came to the harbor, which was lit up by the resin torches of the fishermen who were fishing from their boats. The streets at last became quiet, and the patrol, the officers of which in their splendid costumes, and surrounded by their suites, Passepartout thought seemed like ambassadors, succeeded the bustling crowd. Each time a company passed, Passepartout chuckled and said to himself, Good! Another Japanese embassy departing for Europe. End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of Around the World in Eighty Days。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towel. Chapter 23 in which Passepartout's nose becomes outrageously long. The next morning poor jaded famished Passepartout said to himself that he must get something to eat at all hazards, and the sooner he did so the better. He might indeed sell his watch, but he would have starved first. Now or never he must use the strong if not melodious voice which nature had bestowed upon him. He knew several French and English songs, and resolved to try them upon the Japanese, who must be lovers of music, since they were forever pounding on their cymbals, tam-tams and tambourines, and could not but appreciate European talent. It was perhaps rather early in the morning to get up a concert, and the audience prematurely aroused from their slumbers might not possibly pay their entertainer with coin bearing the Mikado's features. Passepartout therefore decided to wait several hours, and as he was sauntering along it occurred to him that he would seem rather too well dressed for a wandering artist. The idea struck him to change his garments for clothes more in harmony with his project, by which he might also get a little money to satisfy the immediate cravings of hunger. The resolution taken, it remained to carry it out. It was only after a long search that Passepartout discovered a native dealer in old clothes to whom he applied for an exchange. The man liked the European costume, and ere long Passepartout issued from his shop accoutred in an old Japanese coat and a sort of one-sided turban faded with long use. A few small pieces of silver, moreover, jingled in his pocket. Good, thought he, I will imagine I am at the carnival. His first care, after being thus Japaneseed, was to enter a tea-house of modest appearance, and upon half a bird and a little rice, to breakfast like a man for whom dinner was as yet a problem to be solved. Now, thought he, when he had eaten heartily, I must use my head. I can't sell this costume again for one still more Japanese. I must consider how to leave this country of the sun, of which I shall not retain the most delightful of memories, as quickly as possible. It occurred to him to visit the steamers which were about to leave for America. He would offer himself as a cook or servant in payment of his passage and meals. Once at San Francisco he would find some means of going on. The difficulty was how to traverse the 4,700 miles of the Pacific which lay between Japan and the New World. Passepartout was not the man to let an idea go begging, and directed his steps towards the docks. But as he approached them, his project, which at first had seemed so simple, began to grow more and more formidable to his mind. What need would they have of a cook or servant on an American steamer, 
and what confidence would they put in him dressed as he was? What references could he give? As he was reflecting in this wise, his eyes fell upon an immense placard, which a sort of clown was carrying through the streets. This placard, which was in English, read as follows. Acrobatic Japanese Troop, Honorable William Batukler, Proprietor, Last Representations Prior to Their Departure to the United States of the Long Noses, Long Noses, Under the Direct Patronage of the God Tingao, Great Attraction. The United States, said Passepartout, that's just what I want. He followed the clown and soon found himself once more in the Japanese quarter. A quarter of an hour later he stopped before a large cabin adorned with several clusters of streamers, the exterior walls of which were designed to represent in violent colors and without perspective a company of jugglers. This was the Honorable William Battlecourt's establishment. That gentleman was a sort of Barnum, the director of a troop of Montbanks, jugglers, clowns, acrobats, equilibrists, and gymnasts, who, according to the placard, was giving his last performances before leaving the Empire of the Sun for the States of the Union. Passepartout entered and asked for Mr. Battlecar, who straightway appeared in person. "'What do you want?' said he to Passepartout, whom he at first took for a native. "'Would you like a servant, sir?' asked Passepartout. "'A servant?' cried Mr. Battlecar, caressing the thick gray beard which hung from his chin. I already have two who are obedient and faithful, have never left me, and served me for their nourishment, and here they are, added he, holding out his two robust arms, furrowed with veins as large as the strings of a bass vial. So can I be of no use to you? None. The devil! I should like to cross the Pacific with you. Ah, oh, said the Honorable Mr. Battlecar, you're no more a Japanese than I am a monkey. Who are you dressed up in that way? A man dresses as he can. That's true. You are a Frenchman, aren't you? Yes, a Parisian of Paris. Then you ought to know how to make grimaces. Why, replied Passepartout, a little vexed that his nationality should cause this question, we Frenchmen know how to make grimaces. It is true, but not any better than the Americans do. True. Well, if I can't take you as a servant, I can as a clown. You see, my friend, in France they exhibit foreign clowns, and in foreign parts French clowns. Ah! Oh, you are pretty strong, eh? Especially after a good meal. And you can sing? Yes, returned Passepartout, who had formerly been wont to sing in the streets. But can you sing standing on your head, with a top spinning on your left foot? and a sabre balanced on your right. Hmph! I think so, replied Passepartout, recalling the exercises of his younger days. Well, that's enough, said the Honorable William Battlecar. The engagement was concluded there and then. Passepartout had at last found something to do. He was engaged to act in the celebrated Japanese troupe. It was not a very dignified position, but within a week he would be on his way to San Francisco. The performance so noisily announced by the Honorable Mr. Battlecar was to commence at three o'clock, and soon the deafening instruments of a Japanese orchestra resounded at the door. Passepartout, though he had not been able to study or rehearse a part, was designated to lend the aid of his sturdy shoulders in the great exhibition of the human pyramid executed by the long noses of the god Tingao. This great attraction was to close the performance. Before three o'clock the large shed was invaded by the spectators, comprising Europeans and natives, Chinese and Japanese, men, women, and children, who precipitated themselves upon the narrow benches and into the boxes opposite the stage. The musicians took up a position inside and were vigorously performing on their gongs, tam-tams, flutes, bones, tambourines, and immense drums. The performance was much like all acrobatic displays, but it must be confessed that the Japanese are the first equilibrists in the world. One with a fan and some bits of paper performed the graceful trick of the butterflies and the flowers, 
another traced in the air with the odorous smoke of his pipe a series of blue words which composed a compliment to the audience while a third juggled with some lighted candles which he extinguished successively as they passed his lips and relit them again without interrupting for an instant his juggling another reproduced the most singular combinations with a spinning top in his hands the revolving tops seemed to be animated with a life of their own in their interminable whirling they ran over pipe stems the edges of sabres wires and even hairs stretched across the stage they turned around on the edges of large glasses crossed bamboo ladders dispersed into all the corners and produced strange musical effects by the combination of their various pitches of tone the jugglers tossed them in the air threw them like shuttlecocks with wooden battledores and yet they kept on spinning they put them into their pockets and took them out still whirling as before it is useless to describe the astonishing performances of the acrobats and gymnasts the turning on ladders poles balls barrels and so on was executed with wonderful precision but the principal attraction was the exhibition of the long noses a show to which europe is as yet a stranger the long noses form a peculiar company under the direct patronage of the god tingal attired after the fashion of the middle ages they bore upon their shoulders a splendid pair of wings but what especially distinguished them was the long noses which were fastened to their faces and the uses which they made of them these noses were made of bamboo and were five six and even ten feet long some straight others curved some ribboned and some having imitation warts upon them it was upon these bandages fixed tightly on their real noses that they performed their gymnastic exercises a dozen of these sectaries of tingal lay flat upon their backs while others dressed to represent lightning rods came and frolicked on their noses jumping from one to another and performing the most skilful leapings and somersaults as a last scene a human pyramid had been announced in which fifty long noses were to represent the car of juggernaut but instead of forming a pyramid by mounting each other's shoulders the artists were to group themselves on top of the noses it happened that the performer who had hitherto formed the base of the car had quitted the troop and as to fill this part only strength and adroitness were necessary passepartout had been chosen to take his place the poor fellow really felt sad when melancholy reminiscence of his youth he donned his costume adorned with varicolored wings and fastened to his natural feature a false nose six feet long but he cheered up when he thought that this nose was winning him something to eat he went upon the stage and took his place beside the rest who were to compose the best of the car of juggernaut they all stretched themselves on the floor their noses pointing to the ceiling a second group of artists disposed themselves on these long appendages then a third above these then a fourth until a human monument reaching to the very cornices of the theater soon arose on top of the noses this elicited loud applause in the midst of which the orchestra was just striking up a deafening air when the pyramid tottered the balance was lost one of the lower noses vanished from the pyramid and the human monument was shattered like a castle built of cards it was passepartout's fault abandoning his position clearing the footlights without the aid of his wings and clambering up to the right-hand gallery he fell at the feet of one of the spectators crying ah my master my master you are here myself very well then let us go to the steamer young man mr fogg aouda and passepartout passed through the lobby of the theatre to the outside where they encountered the honourable mr battlecar furious with rage he demanded damages for the breakage of the pyramid and phileas fogg appeased him by giving him a handful of banknotes at half past six the very hour of departure mr fogg and aouda followed by passepartout who in his hurry had retained his wings and nose six feet long stepped upon the american steamer end of chapter twenty three
Chapter 24 of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter 24 During which Mr. Fogg and party crossed the Pacific Ocean. What happened when the pilot boat came in sight of Shanghai will be easily guessed. The signals made by the tankadier had been seen by the captain of the Yokohama steamer, who, espying the flag at half-mast, had directed his course towards the little craft. Phileas Fogg, after paying the stipulated price of his passage to John Busby, and rewarding that worthy with the additional sum of five hundred and fifty pounds, ascended the steamer with Aouda and Fix, and they started at once for Nagasaki and Yokohama. They reached their destination on the morning of the 14th of November. Phileas Fogg lost no time in going on board the Carnatic, where he learned to Aouda's great delight, and perhaps to his own, though he betrayed no emotion, that Passepartout, a Frenchman, had really arrived on her the day before. The San Francisco steamer was announced to leave that very evening, and it became necessary to find Passepartout, if possible, without delay. Mr. Fogg applied in vain to the French and English consuls, and after wandering through the streets a long time, began to despair of finding his missing servant. Chance, or perhaps a kind of presentiment, at last led him into the Honorable Mr. Battlecar's theater. He certainly would not have recognized Passepartout in the eccentric Montbank's costume, but the latter, lying on his back, perceived his master in the gallery. He could not help starting, which so changed the position of his nose as to bring the pyramid pell-mell upon the stage. All this Passepartout learned from Aouda, who recounted to him what had taken place on the voyage from Hong Kong to Shanghai on the Tankadier, in company with one Mr. Fix. Passepartout did not change countenance on hearing this name. He thought that the time had not yet arrived to divulge to his master what had taken place between the detective and himself, and in the account he gave of his absence he simply excused himself for having been overtaken by drunkenness in smoking opium at a tavern in Hong Kong. Mr. Fogg heard this narrative coldly, without a word, and then furnished his man with funds necessary to obtain clothing more in harmony with his position. Within an hour the Frenchman had cut off his nose and parted with his wings, and retained nothing about him which recalled the sectary of the god Tingal. The steamer, which was about to depart from Yokohama to San Francisco, belonged to the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, and was named the General Grant. She was a large paddle-wheel steamer of 2,500 tons, well-equipped and very fast. The massive walking beam rose and fell above the deck. At one end a piston rod worked up and down, and at the other was a connecting rod, which in changing the rectilinear motion to a circular one was directly connected with the shaft of the paddles. The general grant was rigged with three masts, giving a large capacity for sails, and thus materially aiding the steam power. By making twelve miles an hour she would cross the ocean in twenty-one days. Phileas Fogg was therefore justified in hoping that he would reach San Francisco by the 2nd of December, New York by the 11th, and London on the 20th, thus gaining several hours on the fatal date of the 21st of December. There was a full complement of passengers on board, among them English, many Americans, a large number of coolies on their way to California, and several East Indian officers who were spending their vacation in making the tour of the world. Nothing of moment happened on the voyage. The steamer, sustained on its large paddles, rolled but little, and the Pacific almost justified its name. Mr. Fogg was as calm and taciturn as ever. His young companion felt herself more and more attached to him by other ties than gratitude. His silent but generous nature impressed her more than she thought, and it was almost unconsciously that she yielded to emotions which did not seem to have the least effect upon her protector. Aouda took the keenest interest in his plans, and became impatient at any incident which seemed likely to retard his journey. 
She often chatted with Passepartout, who did not fail to perceive the state of the lady's heart, and being the most faithful of domestics, he never exhausted his eulogies of Phileas Fogg's honesty, generosity, and devotion. He took pains to calm Aouda's doubts of a successful termination of the journey, telling her that the most difficult part of it had passed, that now they were beyond the fantastic countries of Japan and China, and were fairly on their way to civilized places again. A railway train from San Francisco to New York, and a transatlantic steamer from New York to Liverpool, would doubtless bring them to the end of this impossible journey round the world within the period agreed upon. On the ninth day after leaving Yokohama, Phileas Fogg had traversed exactly one-half of the terrestrial globe. The General Grant passed on the 23rd of November, the 180th meridian, and was at the very antipodes of London. Mr. Fogg had, it is true, exhausted fifty-two of the eighty days in which he was to complete the tour, and there were only twenty-eight left. But though he was only halfway by the difference of meridians, he had really gone over two-thirds of the whole journey, for he had been obliged to make long circuits from London to Aden, from Aden to Bombay, from Calcutta to Singapore, and from Singapore to Yokohama. Could he have followed without deviation the fiftieth parallel, which is that of London, the whole distance would have only been about twelve thousand miles whereas he would be forced by the irregular methods of locomotion to traverse twenty-six thousand, of which he had, on the twenty-third of November, accomplished seventeen thousand five hundred. And now the course was a straight one, and Fix was no longer there to put obstacles in their way. It happened also on the twenty-third of November that Passepartout made a joyful discovery. It will be remembered that the obstinate fellow had insisted on keeping his famous family watch at London time, and on regarding that of the countries he had passed through as quite false and unreliable. Now on this day, though, he had not changed the hands. He found that his watch exactly agreed with the ship's chronometers. His triumph was hilarious. He would have liked to know what Fix would say if he were aboard. "'The rogue told me a lot of stories,' repeated Passepartout, "'about the meridians, the sun, and the moon. "'Moon, indeed. Moonshine, more likely. "'If one listened to that sort of people, "'a pretty sort of time one would keep. "'I was sure that the sun would some day regulate itself by my watch.' "'Passepartout was ignorant that if the face of his watch "'had been divided into twenty-four hours, like the Italian clocks, "'he would have had no reason for exultation for the hands of his watch would then, instead of as now indicating nine o'clock in the morning, indicate nine o'clock in the evening, that is, the twenty-first hour after midnight, precisely the difference between London time and that of the one hundred and eightieth meridian. But if Fix had been able to explain this purely physical effect, Passepartout would not have admitted, even if he had comprehended it. Moreover, if the detective had been on board at that moment, Passepartout would have joined issue with him on a quite different subject, and in an entirely different manner. Where was Fix at that moment? He was actually on board the General Grant. On reaching Yokohama, the detective, leaving Mr. Fogg, whom he expected to meet again during the day, had repaired at once to the English consulate, where he at last found the warrant of arrest. It had followed him from Bombay, and had come by the Carnatic, on which steamer he himself was supposed to be. Fix's disappointment may be imagined when he reflected that the warrant was now useless. Mr. Fogg had left English ground, and it was now necessary to procure his extradition. Well, thought Fix, after a moment of anger, my warrant is not good here, but it will be in England. The rogue evidently intends to return to his own country, thinking he has thrown the police off his track. Good, I will follow him across the Atlantic. As for the money, heaven grant there may be some left. But the fellow has already spent in travelling, rewards, trials, bail, elephants, and all sorts of charges, more than five thousand pounds. Yet, after all, the bank is rich. His course decided on, he went on board the General Grant, and was there when Mr. Fogg and Aouda arrived. To his utter amazement he recognized Passepartout, despite his theatrical disguise. 
he quickly concealed himself in his cabin to avoid an awkward explanation, and hoped, thanks to the number of passengers, to remain unperceived by Mr. Fogg's servant. On that very day, however, he met Passepartout face to face on the forward deck. The latter, without a word, made a rush for him, grasped him by the throat, and much to the amusement of a group of Americans, who immediately began to bet on him, administered to the detective a perfect volley of blows, which proved the great superiority of French over English pugilistic skill. When Passepartout had finished, he found himself relieved and comforted. Fix got up in a somewhat rumpled condition, and looking at his adversary, coldly said, "'Have you done?' "'For this time, yes. Then let me have a word with you. But I—' "'In your master's interests.' Passepartout seemed to be vanquished by Fix's coolness, for he quietly followed him, and they sat down aside from the rest of the passengers. "'You have given me a threshing,' said Fix. "'Good. I expected it. Now listen to me. Up to this time I have been Mr. Fogg's adversary. I am now in his game.' "'Aha!' cried Passepartout. "'You are convinced he is an honest man?' "'No,' replied Fix coldly. I think him a rascal. Shh! Don't budge, and let me speak. As long as Mr. Fogg was on English ground, it was for my interest to detain him there until my warrant of arrest arrived. I did everything I could to keep him back. I sent the Bombay priests after him. I got you intoxicated at Hong Kong. I separated you from him, and I made him miss the Yokohama steamer. Passepartout listened with closed fists. Now— resumed Fix. Mr. Fogg seems to be going back to England. Well, I will follow him there, but hereafter I will do as much to keep obstacles out of his way as I have done up to this time to put them in his path. I've changed my game, you see, and simply because it was for my interest to change it. Your interest is the same as mine, for it is only in England that you will ascertain whether you are in the service of a criminal or an honest man." Passepartout listened very attentively to Fix, and was convinced that he spoke with entire good faith. "'Are we friends?' asked the detective. "'Friends? No,' replied Passepartout. "'But allies, perhaps. At the least sign of treason, however, I'll twist your neck for you.' "'Agreed,' said the detective quietly. Eleven days later, on the 3rd of December, the General Grant entered the bay of the Golden Gate and reached San Francisco. Mr. Fogg had neither gained nor lost a single day. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of Around the World in Eighty Days – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 25 In Which a Slight Glimpse is Had of San Francisco It was seven in the morning when Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout set foot upon the American continent, if this name can be given to the floating quay upon which they disembarked. These quays, rising and falling with the tide, thus facilitate the loading and unloading of vessels. Alongside them were clippers of all sizes, steamers of all nationalities, and the steamboats with several decks rising one above the other, which ply on the Sacramento and its tributaries. There were also heaped up the products of a commerce which extends to Mexico, Chile, Peru, Brazil, Europe, Asia, and all the Pacific Islands. Passepartout, in his joy on reaching at last the American continent, thought he would manifest it by executing a perilous vault in fine style, but tumbling upon some worm-eaten planks he fell through them. Put out of countenance by the manner in which he thus set foot upon the new world, he uttered a loud cry which so frightened the innumerable cormorants and pelicans that are always perched upon these movable quays that they flew noisily away. Mr. Fogg, on reaching shore, proceeded to find out at what hour the first train left for New York, and learned that this was at six o'clock p.m. He had, therefore, an entire day to spend in the Californian capital. 
Taking a carriage at a charge of three dollars, he and Aouda entered it, while Passepartout mounted the box beside the driver, and they set out for the International Hotel. From his exalted position Passepartout observed with much curiosity the wide streets, the low, evenly ranged houses, the Anglo-Saxon Gothic churches, the great docks, the palatial wooden and brick wire houses, the numerous conveyances, omnibuses, horse cars, and upon the sidewalks not only Americans and Europeans, but Chinese and Indians. Passepartout was surprised at all he saw. San Francisco was no longer the legendary city of 1849, a city of banditti, assassins, and incendiaries, who had flocked hither in crowds in pursuit of plunder, a paradise of outlaws where they gambled with gold dust, a revolver in one hand and a bowie knife in the other. It was now a great commercial emporium. The lofty tower of its city hall overlooked the whole panorama of the streets and avenues which cut each other at right angles, and in the midst of which appeared pleasant, verdant squares, while beyond appeared the Chinese quarter, seemingly imported from the celestial empire in a toy box. Sombreros and red shirts and plumed Indians were rarely to be seen, but there were silk hats and black coats everywhere worn by a multitude of nervously active, gentlemanly-looking men. Some of the streets, especially Montgomery Street, which is to San Francisco what Regent Street is to London, the Boulevard des Italiens to Paris, and Broadway to New York, were lined with splendid and spacious stores, which exposed in their windows the products of the entire world. When Passepartout reached the International Hotel, it did not seem to him as if he had left England at all. The ground floor of the hotel was occupied by a large bar, a sort of restaurant freely open to all passers-by, who might partake of dried beef, oyster soup, biscuits, and cheese without taking out their purses. Payment was made only for the ale, porter, or sherry which was drunk. This seemed very American to Passepartout. The hotel refreshment rooms were comfortable, and Mr. Fogg and Aouda, installing themselves at a table, were abundantly served on diminutive plates by negroes of darkest hue. After breakfast, Mr. Fogg, accompanied by Aouda, started for the English consulate to have his passport visaed. As he was going out, he met Passepartout, who asked him if it would not be well, before taking the train, to purchase some dozens of Enfield rifles and Colt's revolvers. He had been listening to stories of attacks upon the trains by the Sioux and Pawnees. Mr. Fogg thought it a useless precaution, but told him to do as he thought best, and went on to the consulate. He had not proceeded two hundred steps, however, when, by the greatest chance in the world, he met Fix. The detective seemed wholly taken by surprise. What? Had Mr. Fogg and himself crossed the Pacific together, and not met on the steamer? At least Fix felt honored to behold once more the gentleman to whom he owed so much, and, as his business recalled him to Europe, he should be delighted to continue the journey in such pleasant company. Mr. Fogg replied that the honor would be his, and the detective, who was determined not to lose sight of him, begged permission to accompany them in their walk about San Francisco, a request which Mr. Fogg readily granted. They soon found themselves in Montgomery Street, where a great crowd was collected. The sidewalks, street, horse-car rails, the shop doors, the windows of the houses, and even the roofs were full of people. Men were going about carrying large posters, and flags and streamers were floating in the wind, while loud cries were heard on every hand. Hurrah for Cammerfield! Hurrah for Mendeboy! It was a political meeting, at least so Fix conjectured, who said to Mr. Fogg, Perhaps we had better not mingle with the crowd. There may be danger in it. Yes, returned Mr. Fogg and blows, even if they are political, are still blows. Fix smiled at this remark, and, in order to be able to see without being jostled about, the party took a position on the top of a flight of steps situated at the upper end of Montgomery Street. Opposite them, on the other side of the street, between a coal wharf and a petroleum warehouse, a large platform had been erected in the open air, towards which the current of the crowd seemed to be directed. 
For what purpose was this meeting? What was the occasion of this excited assemblage? Phileas Fogg could not imagine. Was it to nominate some high official, a governor or member of Congress? It was not improbable, so agitated was the multitude before them. Just at this moment there was an unusual stir in the human mass. All the hands were raised in the air. Some, tightly closed, seemed to disappear suddenly in the midst of the cries, an energetic way, no doubt, of casting a vote. The crowd swayed back. The banners and flags wavered, disappeared an instant, and then reappeared in tatters. The undulations of the human surge reached the steps, while all the heads floundered on the surface like a sea agitated by a squall. Many of the black hats disappeared, and the greater part of the crowd seemed to have diminished in height. "'It is evidently a meeting,' said Fix, "'and its object must be an exciting one. I should not wonder if it were about the Alabama, despite the fact that the question is settled.' Perhaps, replied Mr. Fogg simply. At least there are two champions in presence of each other, the Honorable Mr. Cammerfield and the Honorable Mr. Mandeboy. Ayuda, leaning upon Mr. Fogg's arm, observed the tumultuous scene with surprise, while Fix asked the man near him what the cause of it all was. Before the man could reply, a fresh agitation arose. Hurrahs and excited shouts were heard. The staffs of the banners began to be used as offensive weapons, and fists flew about in every direction. Thumps were exchanged from the tops of the carriages and omnibuses, which had been blocked up in the crowd. Boots and shoes went whirling through the air, and Mr. Fogg thought he even heard the crack of revolvers mingling in the din, the rout approaching the stairway, and flowed over the lower step. One of the parties had evidently been repulsed, but the mere lookers-on could not tell whether Mandeboy or Cammerfield had gained the upper hand. "'It would be prudent for us to retire,' said Fix, who was anxious that Mr. Fogg should not receive any injury, at least until they got back to London. "'If there is any question about England in all this, and we were recognized, I fear it would go hard with us.' "'An English subject,' began Mr. Fogg, he did not finish his sentence, for a terrific hubbub now arose on the terrace behind the flight of steps where they stood, and there were frantic shouts of, Hurrah for Mandeboy! Hip, hip, hurrah! It was a band of voters coming to the rescue of their allies and taking the Camerfield forces in flank. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Fix found themselves between two fires. It was too late to escape. The torrent of men armed with loaded canes and sticks was irresistible. Phileas Fogg and Fix were roughly hustled in their attempts to protect their fair companion. The former, as cool as ever, tried to defend himself with the weapons which nature has placed at the end of every Englishman's arm, but in vain. A big brawny fellow with a red beard, flushed face, and broad shoulders, who seemed to be the chief of the band, raised his clenched fist to strike Fogg whom he would have given a crushing blow had not Fix rushed in and received it in his stead. An enormous bruise immediately made its appearance under the detective silk hat, which was completely smashed in. "'Yankee!' exclaimed Mr. Fogg, darting a contemptuous look at the ruffian. "'Englishman!' returned the other. "'We will meet again. When you please. What is your name?' "'Phileas Fogg. And yours?' "'Colonel Stamp Proctor?' The human tide now swept by after overturning Fix, who speedily got upon his feet again, though with tattered clothes. Happily he was not seriously hurt. His traveling overcoat was divided into two unequal parts, and his trousers resembled those of certain Indians, which fit less compactly than they are easy to put on. Aouda had escaped unharmed, and Fix alone bore marks of the fray in his black and blue bruise. "'Thanks,' said Mr. Fogg to the detective as soon as they were out of the crowd. "'No thanks are necessary,' replied Fix. "'But let us go. Where? To a tailor's.' Such a visit was indeed opportune. The clothing of both Mr. Fogg and Fix was in rags, as if they had themselves been actively engaged in the contest between Cammerfield and Mandeboy. An hour after they were once more suitably attired, 
and with Aouda returned to the International Hotel. Passepartout was waiting for his master, armed with half a dozen six-barreled revolvers. When he perceived Fix, he knit his brows, but Aouda, having in a few words told him of their adventure, his countenance resumed its placid expression. Fix evidently was no longer an enemy, but an ally. He was faithfully keeping his word. Dinner over, the coach which was to convey the passengers and their luggage to the station drew up to the door. As he was getting in, Mr. Fogg said to Fix, "'You have not seen this Colonel Proctor again?' "'No.' "'I will come back to America to find him,' said Phileas Fogg calmly. "'It would not be right for an Englishman to permit himself to be treated in that way without retaliating.' The detective smiled, but did not reply. It was clear that Mr. Fogg was one of those Englishmen who, while they do not tolerate dueling at home, fight abroad when their honor is attacked. At a quarter before six the travelers reached the station and found the train ready to depart. As he was about to enter it, Mr. Fogg called a porter and said to him, "'My friend, was there not some trouble today in San Francisco?' "'It was a political meeting, sir,' replied the porter." "'But I thought there was a great deal of disturbance in the streets. "'It was only a meeting assembled for an election.' "'The election of a general-in-chief, no doubt?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'No, sir, of a justice of the peace.' Phileas Fogg got into the train, which started off at full speed. End of chapter 25《ジャプター・トゥエンティ・シックス・オブ・アラウンド・ウォールド・イン・エイティ・デイズ。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter Twenty Six In Which Phileas Fogg and Party Travel by the Pacific Railroad. From ocean to ocean, so say the Americans and these four words compose the general designation of the great trunk line which crosses the entire width of the united states the pacific railroad is however really divided into two distinct lines the central pacific between san francisco and ogden and the union pacific between ogden and omaha five main lines connect omaha with new york New York and San Francisco are thus united by an uninterrupted metal ribbon, which measures no less than 3,786 miles. Between Omaha and the Pacific, the railway crosses a territory which is still infested by Indians and wild beasts, and a large tract which the Mormons, after they were driven from Illinois in 1845, began to colonize. The journey from New York to San Francisco consumed, formerly, under the most favorable conditions, at least six months. It is now accomplished in seven days. It was in 1862 that, in spite of the southern members of Congress who wished a more southerly route, it was decided to lay the road between the 41st and 42nd parallels. President Lincoln himself fixed the end of the line at Omaha, in Nebraska. The work was at once commenced and pursued with true American energy. Nor did the rapidity with which it went on injuriously affect its good execution. The road grew on the prairies a mile and a half a day. A locomotive running on the rails laid down the evening before brought the rails to be laid on the morrow and advanced upon them as fast as they were put in position. The Pacific Railroad is joined by several branches in Iowa, Kansas, Colorado, and Oregon. On leaving Omaha, it passes along the left bank of the Platte River as far as the junction of its northern branch, follows its southern branch, crosses the Laramie Territory and the Wasatch Mountains, turns the Great Salt Lake and reaches Salt Lake City, the Mormon capital, plunges into the Tooele Valley across the American desert cedar and humboldt mountains the sierra nevada and descends via sacramento to the pacific its grade even on the rocky mountains never exceeding one hundred and twelve feet to the mile such was the road to be traversed in seven days which would enable phileas fogg at least so he hoped to take the atlantic steamer at new york on the eleventh for liverpool 
The car which he occupied was a sort of long omnibus on eight wheels, and with no compartments in the interior. It was supplied with two rows of seats perpendicular to the direction of the train on either side of an aisle which conducted to the front and rear platforms. These platforms were found throughout the train, and the passengers were able to pass from one end of the train to the other. It was supplied with saloon cars, balcony cars, restaurants and smoking cars. Theater cars alone were wanting, and they will have these some day. Book and news dealers, sellers of edibles, drinkables, and cigars, who seemed to have plenty of customers, were continually circulating in the aisles. The train left Oakland Station at six o'clock. It was already night, cold and cheerless, the heavens being overcast with clouds which seemed to threaten snow. The train did not proceed rapidly. Counting the stoppages, it did not run more than twenty miles an hour, which was a sufficient speed, however, to enable it to reach Omaha within its designated time. There was but little conversation in the car, and soon many of the passengers were overcome with sleep. Passepartout found himself beside the detective, but he did not talk to him. After recent events, their relations with each other had grown somewhat cold. There could no longer be mutual sympathy or intimacy between them. Fix's manner had not changed, but Passepartout was very reserved and ready to strangle his former friend on the slightest provocation. Snow began to fall an hour after they started, a fine snow, however, which happily could not obstruct the train. Nothing could be seen from the windows but a vast white sheet against which the smoke of the locomotive had a grayish aspect. At eight o'clock a steward entered the car and announced that the time for going to bed had arrived, and in a few minutes the car was transformed into a dormitory. The backs of the seats were thrown back, bedsteads carefully packed were rolled out by an ingenious system, berths were suddenly improvised, and each traveller had soon, at his disposition, a comfortable bed, protected from curious eyes by thick curtains. The sheets were clean and the pillows soft. It only remained to go to bed and sleep, which everybody did, while the train sped on across the state of California. The country between San Francisco and Sacramento is not very hilly. The Central Pacific, taking Sacramento for its starting point, extends eastward to meet the road from Omaha. The line from San Francisco to Sacramento runs in a northeasterly direction along the American River, which empties into San Pablo Bay. The one hundred and twenty miles between these cities were accomplished in six hours, and towards midnight, while fast asleep, the travelers passed through Sacramento, so that they saw nothing of that important place, the seat of the state government with its fine quays, its broad streets, its noble hotels, squares, and churches. The train on leaving Sacramento, passing the junction Rockland, Auburn, and Colfax, entered the range of the Sierra Nevada. Cisco was reached at seven in the morning, and an hour later the dormitory was transformed into an ordinary car, and the travelers could observe the picturesque beauties of the mountain region through which they were steaming. The railway track wound in and out among the passes, now approaching the mountain sides, now suspended over precipices, avoiding abrupt angles by bold curves, plunging into narrow defiles which seemed to have no outlet. The locomotive, its great funnel emitting a weird light, with its sharp bell and its cowcatcher extended like a spur, mingled its shrieks and bellowings with the noise of torrents and cascades, and twined its smoke among the branches of the gigantic pines. There were few or no bridges or tunnels on the route. The railway turned around the sides of the mountains and did not attempt to violate nature by taking the shortest cut from one point to another. The train entered the state of Nevada through the Carson Valley about nine o'clock, going always northeasterly, and at midday reached Reno, where there was a delay of twenty minutes for breakfast. From this point the road running along Humboldt River passed northward for several miles by its banks, then it turned eastward and kept by the river until it reached the Humboldt Range, nearly at the extreme eastern limit of Nevada. 
Having breakfasted, Mr. Fogg and his companions resumed their places in the car and observed the varied landscape which unfolded itself as they passed along the vast prairies. The mountains lining the horizon and the creeks with their frothy foaming streams sometimes a great herd of buffaloes massing together in the distance seemed like a movable dam these innumerable multitudes of ruminating beasts often form an insurmountable obstacle to the passage of the trains thousands of them have been seen passing over the track for hours together in compact ranks the locomotive is then forced to stop and wait till the road is once more clear this happened indeed to the train in which mr fogg was travelling about twelve o'clock a troop of ten or twelve thousand head of buffalo encumbered the track the locomotive slackening its speed tried to clear the way with its cow-catcher but the mass of animals was too great the buffaloes marched along with a tranquil gait uttering now and then deafening bellowings there was no use of interrupting them, for, having taken a particular direction, nothing can moderate and change their course. It is a torrent of living flesh which no dam could contain. The travelers gazed on this curious spectacle from the platforms, but Phileas Fogg, who had the most reason of all to be in a hurry, remained in his seat and waited philosophically until it should please the buffaloes to get out of the way. Passepartout was furious at the delay they occasioned, and longed to discharge his arsenal of revolvers upon them. "'What a country!' cried he. "'Mere cattle stop the trains and go by in a procession, just as if they were not impeding travel. Parbleu! I should like to know if Mr. Fogg foresaw this mishap in his program. And here's an engineer who doesn't dare to run the locomotive into this herd of beasts.' The engineer did not try to overcome the obstacle and he was wise. He would have crushed the first buffaloes, no doubt, with the cow-catcher, but the locomotive, however powerful, would soon have been checked. The train would inevitably have been thrown off the track, and would then have been helpless. The best course was to wait patiently and regain the lost time by greater speed when the obstacle was removed. The procession of buffaloes lasted three full hours, and it was night before the track was clear. The last ranks of the herd were now passing over the rails, while the first had already disappeared below the southern horizon. It was eight o'clock when the train passed through the defiles of the Humboldt Range, and half-past nine when it penetrated Utah, the region of the Great Salt Lake, the singular colony of the Mormons. End of chapter 26《Chapter Twenty Seven of Around the World in Eighty Days》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Around the World in Eighty Days》by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell.《Chapter Twenty Seven, in which Passepartout undergoes, at a speed of twenty miles an hour, a course of Mormon history. During the night of the fifth of December. The train ran southeasterly for about fifty miles, then rose an equal distance in a northeasterly direction towards the Great Salt Lake. Passepartout, about nine o'clock, went out upon the platform to take the air. The weather was cold, the heavens gray, but it was not snowing. The sun's disk, enlarged by the mist, seemed an enormous ring of gold, and Passepartout was amusing himself by calculating its value in pounds sterling when he was diverted from this interesting study by a strange-looking personage who made his appearance on the platform. This personage, who had taken the train at Elko, was tall and dark, with black moustache, black stockings, a black silk hat, a black waistcoat, black trousers, a white cravat, and dog-skin gloves. He might have been taken for a clergyman. He went from one end of the train to the other, and affixed to the door of each car a notice written in manuscript. Passepartout approached and read one of these notices, which stated that Elder William Hitch, Mormon missionary, taking advantage of his presence on train number 48, would deliver a lecture on Mormonism in car number 117 from 11 to 12 o'clock, and that he invited all who were desirous of being instructed concerning the mysteries of the religion of the Latter-day Saints to attend. "'I'll go,' said Passepartout to himself. 
He knew nothing of Mormonism except the custom of polygamy, which is its foundation. The news quickly spread through the train, which contained about one hundred passengers, thirty of whom, at most, attracted by the notice, ensconced themselves in car number 117. Passepartout took one of the front seats. Neither Mr. Fogg nor Fix cared to attend. At the appointed hour Elder William Hitch rose, and in an irritated voice, as if he had already been contradicted, said, "'I'll tell you that Joe Smith is a martyr, that his brother Hiram is a martyr, and that the persecutions of the United States government against the prophets will also make a martyr of Brigham Young. Who dares to say the contrary?' No one ventured to gainsay the missionary, whose excited tone contrasted curiously with his naturally calm visage. No doubt his anger arose from the hardships to which the Mormons were actually subjected. The government had just succeeded with some difficulty in reducing these independent fanatics to its rule. It had made itself master of Utah, and subjected that territory to the laws of the Union, after imprisoning Brigham Young on a charge of rebellion and polygamy. The disciples of the prophet had since redoubled their efforts, and resisted by words at least the authority of Congress. Elder Hitch, as is seen, was trying to make proselytes on the very railway trains. Then, emphasizing his words with his loud voice and frequent gestures, he related the history of the Mormons from biblical times, how that in Israel a Mormon prophet of the tribe of Joseph published the annals of the new religion and bequeathed them to his son Mormon, how many centuries later a translation of this precious book, which was written in Egyptian, was made by Joseph Smith, Jr., a Vermont farmer, who revealed himself as a mystical prophet in 1825, and how, in short, the celestial messenger appeared to him in an illuminated forest and gave him the annals of the Lord. Several of the audience, not being much interested in the missionary's narrative, here left the car. But Elder Hitch, continuing his lecture, related how Smith, Jr., with his father, two brothers, and a few disciples, founded the Church of the Latter-day Saints, which adopted, not only in America, but in England, Norway, and Sweden, and Germany, counts many artisans as well as men engaged in the liberal professions among its members, how a colony was established in Ohio, a temple erected there at a cost of two hundred thousand dollars, and a town built at Kirtland how Smith became an enterprising banker, and received from a simple mummy showman a papyrus scroll written by Abraham and several famous Egyptians. The elder's story became somewhat wearisome, and his audience grew gradually less, until it was reduced to twenty passengers, but this did not disconcert the enthusiast, who proceeded with the story of Joseph Smith's bankruptcy in 1837, and how his ruined creditors gave him a coat of tar and feathers, his reappearance some years afterwards, more honorable and honored than ever, at Independence, Missouri, the chief of a flourishing colony of three thousand disciples, and his pursuit thence by outraged Gentiles and retirement into the far west. Ten hearers only were now left, among them honest Passepartout, who was listening with all his ears. Thus he learned that, after long persecutions, Smith reappeared in Illinois, and in 1839 founded a community at Nauvoo, on the Mississippi, numbering 25,000 souls, of which he became mayor, chief justice, and general-in-chief, that he announced himself in 1843 as a candidate for the presidency of the United States, and that finally being drawn into the ambuscade at Carthage, he was thrown into prison and assassinated by a band of men disguised in masks. Passepartout was now the only person left in the car, and the elder, looking him full in the face, reminded him that two years after the assassination of Joseph Smith, the inspired prophet Brigham Young, his successor, left Nauvoo for the banks of the Great Salt Lake, where, in the midst of that fertile region, directly on the route of the emigrants who crossed Utah on their way to California, the new colony, thanks to the polygamy practiced by the Mormons, had flourished beyond expectations. And this, added Elder William Hitch, this is why the jealousy of Congress has been aroused against us. Why have the soldiers of the Union invaded the soil of Utah? Why has Brigham Young, our chief, been imprisoned in contempt of all justice? Shall we yield to force? Never! 
driven from Vermont, driven from Illinois, driven from Ohio, driven from Missouri, driven from Utah, we shall yet find some independent territory on which to plant our tents. And you, my brother, continued the elder, fixing his angry eyes upon his single auditor, will you not plant yours there, too, under the shadow of our flag? No, replied Passepartout courageously, in his turn retiring from the car and leaving the elder to preach the vacancy. During the lecture the train had been making good progress, and towards half-past twelve it reached the northwest border of the Great Salt Lake. Thence the passengers could observe the vast extent of this interior sea, which is also called the Dead Sea, and into which flows an American Jordan. It is a picturesque expanse, framed in lofty crags in large strata, encrusted with white salt, a superb sheet of water which was formerly of larger extent than now, its shores having encroached with the lapse of time, and thus at once reduced its breadth and increased its depth. The Salt Lake, seventy miles long and thirty-five wide, is situated three miles eight hundred feet above the sea, quite different from Lake Asphaltite, whose depression is twelve hundred feet below the sea, it contains considerable salt, and one quarter of the weight of its water is solid matter, its specific weight being one thousand one hundred seventy, and after being distilled one thousand. Fishes are, of course, unable to live in it and those which descend through the Jordan, the Weber, and other streams soon perish. The country around the lake was well cultivated, for the Mormons are mostly farmers, while ranches and pens for domesticated animals, fields of wheat, corn, and other cereals, luxuriant prairies, hedges of wild rose, clumps of acacias, and milkwort, would have been seen six months later. Now the ground was covered with a thin powdering of snow. The train reached Ogden at two o'clock, where it rested for six hours. Mr. Fogg and his party had time to pay a visit to Salt Lake City, connected with Ogden by a branch road, and they spent two hours in this strikingly American town, built on the pattern of other cities of the Union, like a checkerboard, with the somber sadness of right angles, as Victor Hugo expresses it. The founder of the City of the Saints could not escape from the taste for symmetry which distinguishes the Anglo-Saxons. In this strange country, where the people are certainly not up to the level of their institutions, everything is done squarely, cities, houses, and follies. The travelers, then, were promenading at three o'clock about the streets of the town built between the banks of the Jordan and the spurs of the Wasatch Range. They saw few or no churches, but the prophet's mansion, the courthouse, and the arsenal, blue brick houses with verandas and porches, surrounded by gardens bordered with acacias, palms, and locusts. A clay and pebble wall built in 1853 surrounded the town, and in the principal street were the market and several hotels adorned with pavilions. The place did not seem thickly populated. The streets were almost deserted except in the vicinity of the temple, which they only reached after having traversed several quarters surrounded by palisades. There were many women, which was easily accounted for by the peculiar institution of the Mormons, but it must not be supposed that all the Mormons are polygamous. They are free to marry or not as they please, but it is worth noting that it is mainly the female citizens of Utah who are anxious to marry, as, according to the Mormon religion, Maiden ladies are not admitted to the possession of its highest joys. These poor creatures seem to be neither well-off nor happy. Some, the more well-to-do, no doubt, wore short, open, black silk dresses under a hood or modest shawl. Others were habited in Indian fashion. Passepartout could not behold without a certain fright these women, charged in groups with conferring happiness on a single Mormon. His common sense pitied, above all, the husband, it seemed to him a terrible thing to have to guide so many wives at once across the vicissitudes of life, and to conduct them, as it were, in a body to the Mormon paradise, with the prospect of seeing them in the company of the glorious smith, who doubtless was the chief ornament of that delightful place to all eternity. He felt decidedly repelled from such a vocation, and he imagined, perhaps he was mistaken, that the fair ones of Salt Lake City cast rather alarming glances on his person. Happily, his stay there was but brief. 
At four the party found themselves again at the station, took their places in the train, and the whistle sounded for starting. Just at the moment, however, that the locomotive wheels began to move, cries of stop, stop, were heard. Trains, like time and tide, stopped for no one. The gentleman who uttered the cries was evidently a belated Mormon. He was breathless with running. Happily for him, the station had neither gates nor barriers. He rushed along the track, jumped on the rear platform of the train, and fell exhausted into one of the seats. Passepartout, who had been anxiously watching this amateur gymnast, approached him with lively interest, and learned that he had taken flight after an unpleasant domestic scene. When the Mormon had recovered his breath, Passepartout ventured to ask him politely how many wives he had, for from the manner in which he had decamped it might be thought that he had twenty at least. "'One, sir,' replied the Mormon, raising his arms heavenward. "'One, and that was enough.'" End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter 28 In Which Passepartout Does Not Succeed in Making Anybody Listen to Reason. The train, on leaving Great Salt Lake at Ogden, passed northward for an hour as far as Weber River having completed nearly nine hundred miles from San Francisco. From this point it took an easterly direction towards the jagged Wasatch Mountains. It was in the section included between this range and the Rocky Mountains that the American engineers found the most formidable difficulties in laying the road, and that the government granted a subsidy of forty-eight thousand dollars per mile, instead of sixteen thousand, allowed for the work done on the plains. But the engineers, instead of violating nature, avoided its difficulties by winding around instead of penetrating the rocks. One tunnel only, fourteen thousand feet in length, was pierced in order to arrive at the Great Basin. The track up to this time had reached its highest elevation at the Great Salt Lake. From this point it described a long curve descending towards Bitter Creek Valley to rise again to the dividing ridge of the waters between the Atlantic and the Pacific. There were many creeks in this mountainous region, and it was necessary to cross Muddy Creek, Green Creek, and others upon culverts. Passepartout grew more and more impatient as they went on, while Fix longed to get out of this difficult region and was more anxious than Phileas Fogg himself to be beyond the dangers of delays and accidents and set foot on English soil. At ten o'clock at night the train stopped at Fort Bridger Station, and twenty minutes later entered Wyoming Territory, following the valley of Bitter Creek throughout. The next day, 7 December, they stopped for a quarter of an hour at Green River Station. Snow had fallen abundantly during the night, but being mixed with rain it had half melted, and did not interrupt their progress. The bad weather, however, annoyed Passepartout, for the accumulation of snow by blocking the wheels of the cars would certainly have been fatal to Mr. Fogg's tour. "'What an idea!' he said to himself. "'Why did my master make this journey in winter? Couldn't he have waited for the good season to increase his chances?' While the worthy Frenchman was absorbed in the state of the sky and the depression of the temperature, Aouda was experiencing fears from a totally different cause. Several passengers had got off at Green River, and were walking up and down the platforms, and among these Aouda recognized Colonel Stamp Proctor, the same who had so grossly insulted Phileas Fogg at the San Francisco meeting. Not wishing to be recognized, the young woman drew back from the window, feeling much alarm at her discovery. She was attached to the man who, however coldly, gave her daily evidences of the most absolute devotion. She did not comprehend, perhaps, the depth of the sentiment with which her protector inspired her, which she called gratitude, but which, though she was unconscious of it, was really more than that. Her heart sank within her when she recognized the man whom Mr. Fogg desired, sooner or later, to call to account for his conduct. Chance alone, it was clear, had brought Colonel Proctor on this train, 
But there he was, and it was necessary at all hazards that Phileas Fogg should not perceive his adversary. Aouda seized a moment when Mr. Fogg was asleep to tell Fix and Passepartout whom she had seen. "'That proctor on this train?' cried Fix. "'Well, reassure yourself, madam. Before he settles with Mr. Fogg, he has got to deal with me. It seems to me that I was the more insulted of the two. "'And besides,' added Passepartout, "'I'll take charge of him, colonel as he is.' "'Mr. Fix,' resumed Aouda, "'Mr. Fogg will allow no one to avenge him. He said that he would come back to America to find this man.' Should he perceive Colonel Proctor, we could not prevent a collision which might have terrible results. He must not see him. You are right, madam, replied Fix. A meeting between them might ruin all. Whether he were victorious or beaten, Mr. Fogg would be delayed, and— And, added Passepartout, that would play the game of the gentlemen of the Reform Club. In four days we shall be in New York. Well, if my master does not leave this car during those four days, we may hope that chance will not bring him face to face with this confounded American. We must, if possible, prevent his stirring out of it. The conversation dropped. Mr. Fogg had just woke up and was looking out of the window. Soon after, Passepartout, without being heard by his master or Aouda, whispered to the detective, Would you really fight for him? I would do anything replied Fix, in a tone which betrayed determined will, to get him back living to Europe. Passepartout felt something like a shudder shoot through his frame, but his confidence in his master remained unbroken. Was there any means of detaining Mr. Fogg in the car to avoid a meeting between him and the colonel? It ought not to be a difficult task, since that gentleman was naturally sedentary and little curious. The detective at least seemed to have found a way, for after a few moments he said to Mr. Fogg, "'These are long and slow hours, sir, that we are passing on the railway.' "'Yes,' replied Mr. Fogg, "'but they pass.' "'You were in the habit of playing whist,' resumed Fix, "'on the steamers.' "'Yes, but it would be difficult to do so here. I have neither cards nor partners.' "'Oh, but we can easily buy some cards, for they are sold on all the American trains.' "'And as for partners, if madam plays?' "'Certainly, sir,' Aouda quickly replied. "'I understand whist. It is part of an English education. I myself have some pretensions to playing a good game. Well, here are three of us, and a dummy.' "'As you please, sir,' replied Phileas Fogg, heartily glad to resume his favorite pastime even on the railway. Passepartout was dispatched in search of the steward and soon returned with two packs of cards, some pins, counters, and a shelf covered with cloth. The game commenced. Aouda understood whist sufficiently well, and even received some compliments on her playing from Mr. Fogg. As for the detective, he was simply an adept, and worthy of being matched against his present opponent. Now, thought Passepartout, we've got him. He won't budge. At eleven in the morning the train had reached the dividing ridge of the waters at Bridger Pass, 7,524 feet above the level of the sea, one of the highest points attained by the track in crossing the Rocky Mountains. After going about two hundred miles, the travelers at last found themselves on one of those vast plains which extend to the Atlantic, and which nature has made so propitious for laying the iron road. On the declivity of the Atlantic Basin the first streams, branches of the North Platte River, already appeared. The whole northern and eastern horizon was bounded by the immense semicircular curtain which is formed by the southern portion of the Rocky Mountains, the highest being Laramie Peak. Between this and the railway extended vast plains, plentifully irrigated. On the right rose the lower spurs of the mountainous mass which extends southward to the sources of the Arkansas River, one of the great tributaries of the Missouri. At half-past twelve the travelers caught sight for an instant of Fort Halleck, which commands that section, and in a few more hours the Rocky Mountains were crossed. There was reason to hope, then, that no accident would mark the journey through this difficult country. The snow had ceased falling, and the air became crisp and cold. 
Large birds, frightened by the locomotive, rose and flew off in the distance. No wild beast appeared on the plain. It was a desert in its vast nakedness. After a comfortable breakfast served in the car, Mr. Fogg and his partners had just resumed whist, when a violent whistling was heard, and the train stopped. Passepartout put his head out of the door, but saw nothing to cause the delay. No station was in view. Aouda and Fix feared that Mr. Fogg might take it into his head to get out, but that gentleman contented himself with saying to his servant, "'See what is the matter.' Passepartout rushed out of the car. Thirty or forty passengers had already descended, amongst them Colonel Stamp Proctor. The train had stopped before a red signal which blocked the way. The engineer and conductor were talking excitedly with a signalman, whom the station-master at Medicine Bow, the next stopping-place, had sent on before. The passengers drew around and took part in the discussion, in which Colonel Proctor, with his insolent manner, was conspicuous. Passepartout, joining the group, heard the signalman say, "'No, you can't pass. The bridge at Medicine Bow is shaky and would not bear the weight of the train.' This was a suspension bridge thrown over some rapids about a mile from the place where they now were. According to the signalman, it was in a ruinous condition, several of the iron wires being broken, and it was impossible to risk the passage. He did not in any way exaggerate the condition of the bridge. It may be taken for granted that, rash as the Americans usually are, when they are prudent there is good reason for it. Passepartout, not daring to apprise his master of what he heard, listened with set teeth, immovable as a statue. Hm! cried Colonel Proctor. "'But we are not going to stay here, I imagine, and take root in the snow.' "'Colonel,' replied the conductor, "'we have telegraphed to Omaha for a train, but it is not likely that it will reach Medicine Bow in less than six hours.' Six hours!' cried Passepartout. "'Certainly,' returned the conductor. "'Besides, it will take us as long as that to reach Medicine Bow on foot.' "'But it is only a mile from here.' said one of the passengers. "'Yes, but it's on the other side of the river.' "'And we can't cross that in a boat?' asked the colonel. "'That's impossible. The creek is swelled by the rains. It is a rapid, and we shall have to make a circuit of ten miles to the north to find a ford.' The colonel launched a volley of oaths, denouncing the railway company and the conductor, and Passepartout, who was furious, was not disinclined to make common cause with him. Here was an obstacle indeed which all his master's banknotes could not remove. There was a general disappointment among the passengers who, without reckoning the delay, saw themselves compelled to trudge fifteen miles over a plain covered with snow. They grumbled and protested, and would certainly have thus attracted Phileas Fogg's attention if he had not been completely absorbed in his game. Passepartout found that he could not avoid telling his master what had occurred, and with hanging head he was turning towards the car when the engineer, a true Yankee named Forster, called out, "'Gentlemen, perhaps there is a way, after all, to get over.' "'On the bridge?' asked the passenger. "'On the bridge.' "'With our train?' "'With our train.' Passepartout stopped short and eagerly listened to the engineer. "'But the bridge is unsafe,' urged the conductor. "'No matter,' replied Forster. "'I think that by putting on the very highest speed we might have a chance of getting over.' "'The devil!' muttered Passepartout. But a number of the passengers were at once attracted by the engineer's proposal and Colonel Proctor was especially delighted, and found the plan a very feasible one. He told stories about engineers leaping their trains over rivers without bridges by putting on full steam, and many of those present avowed themselves of the engineer's mind. "'We have fifty chances out of a hundred of getting over,' said one. Eighty, ninety. Passepartout was astonished, and though ready to attempt anything to get over Medicine Creek, thought the experiment proposed a little too American. Besides, thought he, there's still a more simple way, and it does not even occur to any of these people. Sir, said he aloud to one of the passengers, the engineer's plan seems to me a little dangerous, but eighty chances, replied the passenger, turning his back on him. I know it, said Passepartout, turning to another passenger. "'But a simple idea. 
"'Ideas are no use,' returned the American, shrugging his shoulders, "'as the engineer assures us that we can pass.' "'Doubtless,' urged Passepartout, "'we can pass, but perhaps it would be more prudent.' "'What? Prudent?' cried Colonel Proctor, whom this word seemed to excite prodigiously. "'At full speed, don't you see? At full speed?' "'I know, I see,' repeated Passepartout. "'But it would be, if not more prudent, since that word displeases you, at least more natural.' "'Who? What? What's the matter with this fellow?' cried several. The poor fellow did not know to whom to address himself. "'Are you afraid?' asked Colonel Proctor. "'I afraid? Very well. I will show these people that a Frenchman can be as American as they.' "'All aboard!' cried the conductor. "'Yes, all aboard,' repeated Passepartout, and immediately. "'But they can't prevent me from thinking that it would be more natural for us to cross the bridge on foot and let the train come after.' But no one heard this sage reflection, nor would anyone have acknowledged its justice. The passengers resumed their places in the cars. Passepartout took his seat without telling what had passed. The whist players were quite absorbed in their game. The locomotive whistled vigorously. The engineer, reversing the steam, backed the train for nearly a mile, retiring like a jumper in order to take a longer leap. Then, with another whistle, he began to move forward. The train increased its speed, and soon its rapidity became frightful. A prolonged screech issued from the locomotive. The piston worked up and down twenty strokes to the second. They perceived that the whole train, rushing on at the rate of a hundred miles an hour, hardly bore upon the rails at all. And they passed over. It was like a flash. No one saw the bridge. The train leaped, so to speak, from one bank to the other, and the engineer could not stop it until it had gone five miles beyond the station. But scarcely had the train passed the river when the bridge, completely ruined, fell with a crash into the rapids of Medicine Bowl. End of chapter 28《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピー passing Fort Saunders, crossing Cheyenne Pass, and reaching Evans Pass. The road here attained the highest elevation of the journey, 8,092 feet above the level of the sea. The travelers had now only to descend to the Atlantic by limitless plains, leveled by nature. A branch of the Grand Trunk led off southward to Denver, the capital of Colorado. The country round about is rich in gold and silver, and more than fifty thousand inhabitants are already settled there. Thirteen hundred and eighty-two miles had been passed over from San Francisco in three days and three nights. Four days and nights more would probably bring them to New York. Phileas Fogg was not as yet behind hand. During the night Camp Walbach was passed on the left. Lodgepole Creek ran parallel with the road, marking the boundary between the territories of Wyoming and Colorado. They entered Nebraska at eleven, passed near Sedgwick, and touched at Julesburg on the southern branch of the Platte River. It was here that the Union Pacific Railroad was inaugurated on the 23rd of October, 1867, by the chief engineer, General Dodge. Two powerful locomotives carrying nine cars of invited guests, amongst whom was Thomas C. Durant, vice president of the road, stopped at this point. Cheers were given. The Sioux and Pawnees performed an imitation Indian battle. Fireworks were let off, and the first number of the railway pioneer was printed by a press brought on the train. Thus was celebrated the inauguration of this great railroad, a mighty instrument of progress and civilization, thrown across the desert and destined to link together cities and towns which do not yet exist. The whistle of the locomotive, more powerful than Amphion's lyre, was about to bid them rise from American soil. Fort McPherson was left behind at eight in the morning, 
and three hundred and fifty-seven miles had yet to be traversed before reaching Omaha. The road followed the capricious windings of the southern branch of the Platte River on its left bank. At nine the train stopped at the important town of North Platte, built between the two arms of the river, which rejoin each other around it and form a single artery, a large tributary whose waters empty into the Missouri a little above Omaha. The one hundred and first meridian was passed. Mr. Fogg and his partners had resumed their game. No one, not even the dummy, complained of the length of the trip. Fix had begun by winning several guineas, which he seemed likely to lose, but he showed himself a not less eager whist player than Mr. Fogg. During the morning chance distinctly favored that gentleman. Trumps and honors were showered upon his hands. Once, having resolved on a bold stroke, he was on the point of playing a spade when a voice behind him said, I should play a diamond. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Fix raised their heads and beheld Colonel Proctor. Stamp Proctor and Phileas Fogg recognized each other at once. Ah, it's you, is it, Englishman? cried the Colonel. It's you who are going to play a spade. And who plays it? replies Phileas Fogg coolly, throwing down the ten of spades. Well, it pleases me to have it diamonds, replied Colonel Proctor in an insolent tone. He made a movement as if to seize the card which had just been played, adding, You don't understand anything about whist. Perhaps I do as well as another, said Phileas Fogg, rising. You have only to try, son of John Bull, replied the Colonel. Aouda turned pale, and her blood ran cold. She seized Mr. Fogg's arm and gently pulled him back. Passepartout was ready to pounce upon the American, who was staring insolently at his opponent. But Fix got up, and going to Colonel Proctor said, "'You forget that it is I with whom you have to deal, sir, for it was I whom you not only insulted but struck.' "'Mr. Fix,' said Mr. Fogg, "'pardon me, but this affair is mine, and mine only.' The colonel has again insulted me by insisting that I should not play a spade, and he shall give me satisfaction for it. When and where you will, replied the American, and with whatever weapon you choose. Aouda in vain attempted to retain Mr. Fogg, as vainly did the detective endeavor to make the quarrel his. Passepartout wished to throw the colonel out of the window, but a sign from his master checked him. Phileas Fogg left the car and the American followed him upon the platform. "'Sir,' said Mr. Fogg to his adversary, "'I am in a great hurry to get back to Europe, and any delay whatever will be greatly to my disadvantage.' "'Well, what's that to me?' replied Colonel Proctor. "'Sir,' said Mr. Fogg very politely, "'after our meeting in San Francisco, I determined to return to America and find you as soon as I had completed the business which called me to England.' really will you appoint a meeting for six months hence why not ten years hence i say six months returned phileas fogg and i shall be at the place of meeting promptly all this is an evasion cried stamp proctor now or never very good you are going to new york no to chicago no to omaha what difference is it to you do you know Plum Creek? No, replied Mr. Fogg. It's the next station. The train will be there in an hour, and we will stop there ten minutes. In ten minutes several revolver shots could be exchanged. Very well, said Mr. Fogg. I will stop at Plum Creek. And I guess you'll stay there, too, added the American insolently. Who knows? replied Mr. Fogg, returning to the car as coolly as usual. He began to reassure Aouda, telling her that blusterers were never to be feared, and begged Fix to be his second at the approaching duel, a request which the detective could not refuse. Mr. Fogg resumed the interrupted game with perfect calmness. At eleven o'clock the locomotive's whistle announced that they were approaching Plum Creek Station. Mr. Fogg rose, and, followed by Fix, went out upon the platform. Passepartout accompanied him, carrying a pair of revolvers. Aouda remained in the car as pale as death. 
The door of the next car opened, and Colonel Proctor appeared on the platform, attended by a Yankee of his own stamp as his second. But just as the combatants were about to step from the train, the conductor hurried up and shouted, "'You can't get off, gentlemen.' "'Why not?' asked the colonel. "'We are twenty minutes late, and we shall not stop. But I am going to fight a duel with this gentleman.' "'I am sorry,' said the conductor, "'but we shall be off at once. "'There's the bell ringing now.' "'The train started. "'I'm really very sorry, gentlemen,' said the conductor. "'Under any other circumstances I should have been happy to oblige you. "'But after all, as you have not had time to fight here, "'why not fight as we go along?' "'That wouldn't be convenient, perhaps, for this gentleman,' "'said the colonel in a jeering tone. "'It would be perfectly so,' replied Phileas Fogg. "'Well, are we really in America?' thought Passepartout. "'And the conductor is a gentleman of the first order.' So muttering he followed his master. The two combatants, their seconds, and the conductor passed through the cars to the rear of the train. The last car was only occupied by a dozen passengers, whom the conductor politely asked if they would not be so kind as to leave it vacant for a few moments, as two gentlemen had an affair of honor to settle. The passengers granted the request with alacrity and straightway disappeared on the platform. The car, which was some fifty feet long, was very convenient for their purpose. The adversaries might march on each side in the aisle and fire at their ease. Never was duel more easily arranged. Mr. Fogg and Colonel Proctor, each provided with two six-barreled revolvers, entered the car. The seconds remaining outside shut them in. They were to begin firing at the first whistle of the locomotive. After an interval of two minutes, what remained of the two gentlemen would be taken from the car. Nothing could be more simple. Indeed, it was all so simple that Fix and Passepartout felt their hearts beating as if they would crack. They were listening for the whistle agreed upon, when suddenly savage cries resounded in the air, accompanied by reports which certainly did not issue from the car where the duelists were. The reports continued in front and the whole length of the car. Cries of terror proceeded from the interior of the cars. Colonel Proctor and Mr. Fogg, revolvers in hand, hastily quitted their prison and rushed forward where the noise was most clamorous. They then perceived that the train was attacked by a band of Sioux. This was not the first attempt of these daring Indians, for more than once they had waylaid trains on the road. A hundred of them had, according to their habit, jumped upon the steps without stopping the train, with the ease of a clown mounting a horse at full gallop. The Sioux were armed with guns, from which came the reports, to which the passengers, who were almost all armed, responded by revolver shots. The Indians had first mounted the engine, and half stunned the engineer and stoker with blows from their muskets. A Sioux chief, wishing to stop the train but not knowing how to work the regulator, had opened wide instead of closing the steam valve, and the locomotive was plunging forward with terrific velocity. The Sioux had at the same time invaded the cars, skipping like enraged monkeys over the roofs, thrusting open the doors and fighting hand to hand with the passengers. Penetrating the baggage car, they pillaged it, throwing the trunks out of the train. The cries and shots were constant. The travelers defended themselves bravely. Some of the cars were barricaded and sustained a siege, like moving forts, carried along at a speed of a hundred miles an hour. Aouda behaved courageously from the first. She defended herself like a true heroine, with a revolver, which she shot through the broken windows whenever a savage made his appearance. Twenty Sioux had fallen mortally wounded to the ground, and the wheels crushed those who fell upon the rails as if they had been worms. Several passengers shot or stunned lay on the seats. It was necessary to put an end to the struggle, which had lasted for ten minutes, and which would result in the triumph of the Sioux if the train was not stopped. Fort Kearney Station, where there was a garrison, was only two miles distant, but that, once passed, the Sioux would be masters of the train, between Fort Kearney and the station beyond. The conductor was fighting beside Mr. Fogg when he was shot and fell. At the same moment he cried, "'Unless the train is stopped in five minutes, we are lost!' "'It shall be stopped,' said Phileas Fogg, preparing to rush from the car. "'Stay, monsieur!' cried Passepartout. "'I will go!' 
Mr. Fogg had not time to stop the brave fellow, who, opening a door, unperceived by the Indians, succeeded in slipping under the car, and while the struggle continued and the balls whizzed across each other over his head, he made use of his old acrobatic experience, and with amazing agility worked his way under the cars, holding on to the chains, aiding himself by the brakes and edges of the sashes, creeping from one car to another with marvelous skill, and thus gaining the forward end of the train train. There, suspended by one hand between the baggage car and the tender, with the other he loosened the safety chains, but owing to the traction he would never have succeeded in unscrewing the yoking bar had not a violent concussion jolted this bar out. The train, now detached from the engine, remained a little behind, whilst the locomotive rushed forward with increased speed. Carried on by the force already acquired, the train still moved for several minutes, but the brakes were worked, and at last they stopped, less than a hundred feet from Kearney Station. The soldiers of the fort, attracted by the shots, hurried up. The Sioux had not expected them, and decamped in a body before the train entirely stopped. But when the passengers counted each other on the station platform, several were found missing, among others the courageous Frenchman, whose devotion had just saved them. End of chapter 29《Chapter Thirty of Around the World in Eighty Days》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Around the World in Eighty Days》by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell.《Chapter Thirty, in which Phileas Fogg simply does his duty. Three passengers, including Passepartout, had disappeared. Had they been killed in the struggle? Were they taken prisoners by the Sioux? It was impossible to tell. There were many wounded, but none mortally. Colonel Proctor was one of the most seriously hurt. He had fought bravely, and a ball had entered his groin. He was carried into the station with the other wounded passengers to receive such attention as could be of avail. Aouda was safe, and Phileas Fogg, who had been in the thickest of the fight, had not received a scratch. Fix was slightly wounded in the arm, but Passepartout was not to be found, and tears coursed down Aouda's cheeks. All the passengers had got out of the train, the wheels of which were stained with blood. From the tires and spokes hung ragged pieces of flesh. As far as the eye could reach on the white plain behind, red trails were visible. The last Sioux were disappearing in the south, along the banks of Republican River. Mr. Fogg, with folded arms, remained motionless. He had a serious decision to make. Aouda, standing near him, looked at him without speaking, and he understood her look. If his servant was a prisoner, ought he not to risk everything to rescue him from the Indians? "'I will find him living or dead,' said he quietly to Aouda. "'Ah, oh, Mr. F Mr. Fogg,' cried she, clasping his hands and covering them with tears. "'Living,' added Mr. Fogg, "'if we do not lose a moment.' Phileas Fogg, by this resolution, inevitably sacrificed himself. He pronounced his own doom. The delay of a single day would make him lose the steamer at New York, and his bet would be certainly lost. But, as he thought, it is my duty. He did not hesitate.' The commanding officer of Fort Kearney was there. A hundred of his soldiers had placed themselves in a position to defend the station should the Sioux attack it. "'Sir,' said Mr. Fogg to the captain, three passengers have disappeared.' "'Dead?' asked the captain. "'Dead or prisoners. That is the uncertainty which must be solved. Do you propose to pursue the Sioux?' "'That's a serious thing to do, sir,' returned the captain. These Indians may retreat beyond the Arkansas, and I cannot leave the fort unprotected. The lives of three men are in question, sir, said Phileas Fogg. Doubtless, but can I risk the lives of fifty men to save three? I don't know whether you can, sir, but you ought to do so. Nobody here, returned the other, has a right to teach me my duty. Very well, said Mr. Fogg coldly. I will go alone. You, sir? cried Fix, coming up. "'You go alone in pursuit of the Indians?' 
Would you have me leave this poor fellow to perish, him to whom every one present owes his life? I shall go. No, sir, you shall not go alone, cried the captain, touched in spite of himself. No, you are a brave man. Thirty volunteers, he added, turning to the soldiers. The whole company started forward at once. The captain had only to pick his men. Thirty were chosen, and an old sergeant placed at their head. "'Thanks, Captain,' said Mr. Fogg. "'Will you let me go with you?' asked Fix. "'Do as you please, sir, but if you wish to do me a favor, you will remain with Aouda. In case anything should happen to me—' A sudden pallor overspread the detective's face. "'Separate himself from the man whom he had so persistently followed step by step, leave him to wander about in this desert?' Fix gazed attentively at Mr. Fogg, and despite his suspicions and of the struggle which was going on within him, he lowered his eyes before that calm and frank look. "'I will stay,' said he. A few moments after, Mr. Fogg pressed the young woman's hand, and, having confided to her his precious carpet-bag, went off with the sergeant and his little squad. But before going he had said to the soldiers— my friends, I will divide five thousand dollars among you if we save the prisoners. It was then a little past noon. Aouda retired to a waiting room, and there she waited alone, thinking of the simple and noble generosity, the tranquil courage of Phileas Fogg. He had sacrificed his fortune, and was now risking his life all without hesitation, from duty, in silence. Fix did not have the same thoughts, and could scarcely conceal his agitation. He walked feverishly up and down the platform, but soon resumed his outward composure. He now saw the folly of which he had been guilty in letting Fogg go alone. What, this man whom he had just followed around the world, was permitted now to separate himself from him? He began to accuse and abuse himself and, as if he were director of police, administered to himself a sound lecture for his greenness. "'I have been an idiot,' he thought, "'and this man will see it. He is gone, and won't come back. But how is it that I, Fix, who have in my pocket a warrant for his arrest, have been so fascinated by him? Decidedly I am nothing but an ass.' So reasoned the detective, while the hours crept by all too slowly. He did not know what to do. Sometimes he was tempted to tell Aouda all, but he could not doubt how the young woman would receive his confidences. What course should he take? He thought of pursuing Fogg across the vast white plains. It did not seem impossible that he might overtake him. Footsteps were easily printed in the snow, but soon, under a new sheet, every imprint would be effaced. Fix became discouraged. He felt a sort of insurmountable longing to abandon the game altogether. He could now leave Fort Kearney Station and pursue his journey homeward in peace. Towards two o'clock in the afternoon, while it was snowing hard, long whistles were heard approaching from the east. A great shadow preceded by a wild light slowly advanced, appearing still larger through the mist, which gave it a fantastic aspect. No train was expected from the east, neither had there been time for the succor asked for by telegraph to arrive. The train from Omaha to San Francisco was not due till the next day. The mystery was soon explained. The locomotive which was slowly approaching with deafening whistles was that which, having been detached from the train, had continued its route with such terrific rapidity, carrying off the unconscious engineer and stoker. It had run several miles, when, the fire becoming low for want of fuel, the steam had slackened, and it had finally stopped an hour after, some twenty miles beyond Fort Kearney. Neither the engineer nor the stoker was dead, and, after remaining for some time in their swoon, had come to themselves. The train had then stopped. The engineer, when he found himself in the desert, and the locomotive without cars, understood what had happened. He could not imagine how the locomotive had become separated from the train, but he did not doubt that the train left behind was in distress. He did not hesitate what to do. It would be prudent to continue on to Omaha, for it would be dangerous to return to the train which the Indians might still be engaged in pillaging. Nevertheless, he began to rebuild the fire in the furnace. 
the pressure again mounted, and the locomotive returned, running backwards, to Fort Kearney. This it was which was whistling in the mist. The travelers were glad to see the locomotive resume its place at the head of the train. They could now continue the journey so terribly interrupted. Aouda, on seeing the locomotive come up, hurried out of the station, and asked the conductor, "'Are you going to start?' "'At once, madam.' "'But the prisoners are unfortunate fellow-travelers.' "'I cannot interrupt the trip,' replied the conductor. "'We are already three hours behind time.' "'And when will another train pass here from San Francisco?' "'Tomorrow evening, madam.' "'Tomorrow evening? But then it will be too late. We must wait.' "'It is impossible,' responded the conductor. "'If you wish to go, please get in.' "'I will not go,' said Aouda. Fix had heard this conversation. A little while before, when there was no prospect of proceeding on the journey, he had made up his mind to leave Fort Kearney. But now that the train was there, ready to start, and he had only to take his seat in the car, an irresistible influence held him back. The station platform burned his feet, and he could not stir. The conflict in his mind again began. Anger and failure stifled him. He wished to struggle on to the end. Meanwhile, the passengers and some of the wounded, among them Colonel Proctor, whose injuries were serious, had taken their places in the train. The buzzing of the overheated boiler was heard, and the steam was escaping from the valves. The engineer whistled. The train started, and soon disappeared, mingling its white smoke with the eddies of the densely falling snow. The detective had remained behind. Several hours passed. The weather was dismal, and it was very cold. Fix sat motionless on a bench in the station. He might have been thought asleep. Aouda, despite the storm, kept coming out of the waiting-room, going to the end of the platform, and peering through the tempest of snow, as if to pierce the mist which narrowed the horizon around her, and to hear, if possible, some welcome sound. She heard and saw nothing. Then she would return, chilled through, to issue out again after the lapse of a few moments, but always in vain. Evening came, and the little band had not returned. Where could they be? Had they found the Indians, and were they having a conflict with them, or were they still wandering amid the mist? The commander of the fort was anxious, though he tried to conceal his apprehensions. As night approached, the snow fell less plentifully, but it became intensely cold. Absolute silence rested on the plains, Neither flight of bird nor passing of beast troubled the perfect calm. Throughout the night, Aouda, full of sad forebodings, her heart stifled with anguish, wandered about on the verge of the plains. Her imagination carried her far off and showed her innumerable dangers. What she suffered through the long hours it would be impossible to describe. Fix remained stationary in the same place, but did not sleep. Once a man approached and spoke to him, and the detective merely replied by shaking his head. Thus the night passed. At dawn the half-extinguished disk of the sun rose above a misty horizon, but it was now possible to recognize objects two miles off. Phileas Fogg and the squad had gone southward. In the south all was still vacancy. It was then seven o'clock. The captain, who was really alarmed, did not know what course to take. Should he send another detachment to the rescue of the first? Should he sacrifice more men with so few chances of saving those already sacrificed? His hesitation did not last long, however. Calling one of his lieutenants, he was on the point of ordering a reconnaissance when gunshots were heard. Was it a signal? The soldiers rushed out of the fort, and half a mile off they perceived a little band returning in good order. Mr. Fogg was marching at their head, and just behind him were Passepartout and the other two travelers, rescued from the Sioux. They had met and fought the Indians ten miles south of Fort Kearney. Shortly before the detachment arrived, Passepartout and his companions had begun to struggle with their captors, three of whom the Frenchman had felled with his fists when his master and the soldiers hastened up to their relief. All were welcomed with joyful cries. Phileas Fogg distributed the reward he had promised to the soldiers, while Passepartout, not without reason, muttered to himself, 
it must certainly be confessed that I cost my master dear. Fix, without saying a word, looked at Mr. Fogg, and it would have been difficult to analyze the thoughts which struggled within him. As for Aouda, she took her protector's hand and pressed it in her own, too much moved to speak. Meanwhile, Passepartout was looking about for the train. He thought he should find it there, ready to start for Omaha, and he hoped that the time lost might be regained. "'The train! The train!' cried he. "'Gone,' replied Fix. "'And when does the next train pass here?' said Phileas Fogg. "'Not till this evening.' "'Ah!' returned the impassable gentleman quietly. End of chapter 30「Chapter thirty one of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter thirty one, in which Fix the Detective considerably furthers the interests of Phileas Fogg. Phileas Fogg found himself twenty hours behind time. As for two, the involuntary cause of this delay was desperate. He had ruined his master. At this moment the detective approached Mr. Fogg, and, looking him intently in the face, said, "'Seriously, sir, are you in great haste?' "'Quite seriously.' "'I have a purpose in asking,' resumed Fix. "'It is absolutely necessary that you should be in New York on the eleventh, before nine o'clock in the evening, the time that the steamer leaves for Liverpool?' It is absolutely necessary. And if your journey had not been interrupted by these Indians, you would have reached New York on the morning of the 11th? Yes, with eleven hours to spare before the steamer left. Good. You are, therefore, twenty hours behind. Twelve from twenty leaves eight. You must regain eight hours. Do you wish to try to do so? On foot? asked Mr. Fogg. No. "'On a sledge,' replied Fix. "'On a sledge with sails. "'A man has proposed such a method to me.' "'It was the man who had spoken to Fix during the night, "'and whose offer he had refused. "'Phileas Fogg did not reply at once, "'but Fix, having pointed out the man "'who was walking up and down in front of the station, "'Mr. Fogg went up to him. "'An instant after, Mr. Fogg and the American, "'whose name was Mudge, entered a hut built just below the fort. There Mr. Fogg examined a curious vehicle, a kind of frame on two long beams, a little raised in front like the runners of a sledge, and upon which there was room for five or six persons. A high mast was fixed on the frame, held firmly by metallic lashings, to which was attached a large brigantine sail. This mast held an iron stay upon which to hoist a jib-sail, Behind, a sort of rudder served to guide the vehicle. It was, in short, a sledge rigged like a sloop. During the winter, when the trains are blocked up by the snow, these sledges make extremely rapid journeys across the frozen plains from one station to another. Provided with more sails than a cutter, and with the wind behind them, they slip over the surface of the prairies with a speed equal, if not superior, to that of the express trains. Mr. Fogg readily made a bargain with the owner of this land craft. The wind was favorable, being fresh and blowing from the west. The snow had hardened, and Mudge was very confident of being able to transport Mr. Fogg in a few hours to Omaha. Thence the trains eastward run frequently to Chicago and New York. It was not impossible that the lost time might yet be recovered, and such an opportunity was not to be rejected. Not wishing to expose Aouda to the discomforts of traveling in the open air, Mr. Fogg proposed to leave her with Passepartout at Fort Kearney, the servant taking upon himself to escort her to Europe by a better route and under more favorable conditions. But Aouda refused to separate from Mr. Fogg, and Passepartout was delighted with her decision, for nothing could induce him to leave his master while Fix was with him. It would be difficult to guess the detective's thoughts. Was this conviction shaken by Phileas Fogg's return, or did he still regard him as an exceedingly shrewd rascal, 
who, his journey around the world completed, would think himself absolutely safe in England. Perhaps Fix's opinion of Phileas Fogg was somewhat modified, but he was nevertheless resolved to do his duty, and to hasten the return of the whole party to England as much as possible. At eight o'clock the sledge was ready to start. The passengers took their places on it and wrapped themselves up closely in their traveling cloaks. The two great sails were hoisted, and under the pressure of the wind the sledge slid over the hardened snow with a velocity of forty miles an hour. The distance between Fort Kearney and Omaha, as the birds fly, is at most two hundred miles. If the wind held good, 